Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. And today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey. If you guys have ever had a chance to try this stuff out, they are a Texas-based company. They're Dallas County's first distillery, handcrafted, award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels right here in Texas. And it's built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. It is a very, very good whiskey. They are opening a new distillery in Wiley here in the spring, so stay tuned for that with an outdoor venue and a whole walkthrough of, it's about four times as big as their place they have right now in Garland, so we're looking forward to all this and maybe doing some shows out there because this stuff is really, really good, so we appreciate them today. And uh, you guys have any interest in it, just Google Herman Marshall Whiskey. They will flag it out there and get it to you wherever you need it. So we appreciate them. Uh, today's show is, if if anybody can spell this gentleman's name, I will give you a bottle of whiskey. You can't Google it. But anyway, today, a good buddy of mine, former Major Leaguer, World Series, gold medal winning, Doug Minkovich. <laughs> What's up, Dougie? <laughs> Doug McCabe. What's up? How are you, Doug? Close enough, man. Close I, I know. Enough. I know. It's 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 one of those names. I said people sit there and figure it out. It's one of those when you go to a high school graduation and they, Doug. Um, um, it's yeah, you're graduating, right? They're that's not. That's funny you say that because that's <laughs> how I knew every teacher got to my name. They would read out every kid's name and then pause and look at it and I'm like, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, that's me right here. That's so that's every time they got to the, my name and paused, I was like, I just raised my hand. I'm sitting right here. I'm good. Oh yeah. And that's a name that definitely can be butchered for sure. <laughs> right. And it's, so it's, 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 it hasn't, it hasn't stopped. So it's, been, um, but it's been a while, Dougie, what are you up to these days? Oh man, I've managed in the minor leagues for like, like eight, nine years. And, uh, I got let go by the tigers before the pandemic and interviewed for a couple of jobs. Long story short, I was like, you know what? I haven't seen my son play baseball. He's a, he was at the time he was a freshman in high school. And I was like, you know what? I just want to stop and be a dad and uh full-time. Cause you know, the schedule we have. And I, I, I would drive six hours one way to watch him play a little league game and turn on and drive back um, during spring training. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I want to watch my son play baseball and play sports. And I got, I went to a rotary club meeting out of a, a buddy of mine, it, locally here in the Florida Keys and long story short they introduced me as the high school baseball coach and I was like well hang on I want to watch my son play I don't want to coach my son so I got roped into coaching this high school team so that's what I'm doing now and I run an occasional fishing charter here and there just to keep busy and uh you know my son's a junior now so I've got probably two more years before I have to I go back out and start doing something again for a living because this not having a job I have zero free time. So maybe if I go back to work, I'll have to I'll get some time to enjoy some stuff to myself. So you were managing triple, triple eight ball in Toledo. Is that where you were for the last, you said the last few years? Yeah. The last two years I was in Toledo. Yeah. In triple A. All right. So as a manager, what do you, what are you seeing? I know you're, you're an old school guy, <laughs> but what are you seeing as a manager? You know, who else was on that coaching staff too, by the way? I had, uh, Mike Hessman. Um, I had Juan Nieves. I had, I, I've, I've been lucky at Brian Harper. I had a lot of good, like my staffs in Minnesota were great. Uh, Chad Allen was one of my hitting coach and I was lucky. I had the, basically the twins team that got to the big leagues and Max Kepler, Polanco, Buxton, um, Rios, Sano, Rosario. I had that whole entire group and we, we won back to back, almost back to back to back championships at two, two or three different levels. Um, so I was lucky. I had a lot of good, really good coaches and, it's funny. The twins kind of brought me and Chad back to kind of as coaches to they specifically told both of us when we aren't doing things the way we used to do them, please let us know. And the funny thing is when Chad and I started doing that, we got like lambasted and I'm like, well, that's kind of why you guys brought us back. And then I got let go and they fired Terry Ryan and brought in Falvey and the new guys. And, 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 and then I went to, then Ron Gardenhire got the job for the tigers and I was interviewing uh, for them for like a low a ball job. And as soon as Guardy got the job, they called me back and said, well, we want you to manage triple a. So uh, I've seen every, I've been a ball, uh, started my career with the Dodgers hitting coach with Ogden. I had Corey Seager and Jock Peterson and some of those guys. And, um, so I, you know, seeing those being around different organizations, it's the same stuff. And it, 
they don't I go back to analytics and it's like, well, okay, we have to, like, they make us listen to what the analytic guys say and, but they don't want to hear it from the guys that actually do it. And I was in Detroit, literally got told you union guys. And I was like, well, what, what does that really mean? And, and they were like, I remember John Vanderwall was there. He got let go. You union guys, we got to get rid of you guys. And I was like, well, I just, I always go back to if your loved one got sick let's just say they needed a heart transplant. You're not going to send them to a gardener. Um, you know, you're not going to send them to somebody who's actually just read it in a book. You want to actually send your loved one to get fixed by someone who's actually been there because especially in sports, there's in baseball, there's, there's, you can teach it all you want. I always say analytics do a great job of pointing out the obvious. They don't do a very good job of fixing things. They can always tell you what you do wrong, but they don't ever teach you the way to fix it well he's got you know this and his, his, his the angle of his ball is 2.8 and i'm like well yeah he's hitting ground balls i get it like I, I, there's a reason behind it and then we're trying to fix it and it's like if yeah just to me it was like the patience of everybody wants everything done now it's like a hitter right hitters jim told me always said hitters want everything done now they don't want they don't appreciate the work it takes to fix things and and, and that, that always stuck out to me and it's like the same thing where I always got yelled at for being, you know, wanting to win. I actually was told this in Minnesota, your willingness to win is getting in the way of development. And I was like, well, winning is the most important part of development. You're talking about winning games. I'm talking about winning skills. Well, we have to win. If I'm teaching the kid a skill and he's failing, well, we're all losing. Um, I was just trying to break it down. Like I'm trying to teach my my pitchers to win the one-on-one -on -one matchups, um, uh, infielder, a uh, footwork skill, um, an outfielder, you know, false steps and just stuff like that. And they, all that, if they, we do all those things, the winning comes as a product of that. And uh, they didn't want to hear it. And I get it. Sometimes I can be kind of a, you know, org meetings. I could get a little boisterous and I get it, but I was just cause I'm passionate about what I do. And I'm passionate about a sport that gave me literally everything I've ever gotten. And uh, it's, it's really disheartening to see which see the pattern in which it's going. It is. It's, it's you're right, because the way we were taught to play was, you, you know, you put the work in, you know, you respected your guy, you respected your coaches, especially guys that have played. And I was fortunate enough coaching every level to have a major league coach that, you know, understood that to be able. That's what I wanted to listen to. Right. That's what you wanted. You it, it wasn't about numbers. Well, the numbers. No, I, I don't care what the numbers say. I want to see what you know, what what it took to get there, what these guys were doing. Right. And then I was able to weed out. Right, you're not going to take every piece of information you get from everybody. You're going to take little bits and pieces of it and try and piece it together. And if it doesn't work, you get to the big leagues, and these guys are they're there just to kind of fine tune, right? They're not there to, to rechange your swing, right? I remember I had this discussion with Guardy when he was here about guys. Uh, he goes, Mitch, he goes, I got guys that shouldn't even be above a ball in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. He goes, but my hands are tied. What am I supposed to? What am I supposed to do, right? So I mean, I'm sure as a, as a coach, as a manager, you saw that these guys are going. Right, because Guardy's calling, saying, "Hey, we need," or whoever's calling, say, "Hey, hey, Doug, we need to send such and such up." And you're, I'm sure you that's probably the, that's the frustrating part of it because, I, you and I both know, like there's a like there's a pride factor that never leaves a a big leaguer, um, like you get like, you know what you had to do to get there. I know what I had to do to get there. I know what my guy to my left had to do, and. Today's game, and, and I get some of the organizations, they have to, right? But they're just handing it away. They're doing everything wrong at the lower levels or even at the minor league level. And you know they haven't earned their way up there. And I was adamant about, like, no, that that's not who they call down examples. They call down, and I had Caleb Thielbar, and he was coming off injury. Had, like, I knew about him from Minnesota. Worked his way back, and he had, like, a two in the bullpen. And he had, like, a his walk to strikeout was, like, 40 punch outs to like four walks and it every time they'd call and i had pete cosma too and i kept pushing pete cosma pete cosma not going to win you a championship i go but when they would ask for players he'd ask i'd say pete cosma and caleb field bar field bar you can throw every day doesn't care if he gets hit he wants to do well but if he gives up six home runs in a row he's going to grab the ball again tomorrow you can't have a big league team full of kids that you have to have be fixing you need someone who you can like, hey, Pete, you're playing short tonight. Go take your ground balls. He's a pro. He's going to get ready to play, and he's going to play his butt off, and he's going to be 
if younger guys are around and they can absorb how he goes about his business. And if you can't have a bunch of kids that you're up there trying to fix and trying to win games at the big league level. So that, I got caught into that a lot. And it was, you know, and it's like, you, you know, you, you know, they keep the number one question is like, is he ready? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I know he's, he's mastered this level. I can't tell you when they add the third deck, what's going to happen. Cause you've seen it. A lot of guys go up there look like I got a deer in headlights, you know? So it's, you know, Gordy and I kind of had our hands tied a little bit with that stuff, but it went all the way to Minnesota too with Byron Buxton and, you know, Buck wasn't ready. And thankfully he's as gifted as he is because I feel like the twins did everything in their humanly possible power to ruin this kid. And he just kept going. Um, and it kept hitting and it kept getting better. And so, I mean, it just goes on and on about the, you know, I, going back to what you said, like Mike Barnett was a hitting coach I had in Kansas city. Mike didn't play high school baseball, but I knew the guys he had before Sean green, Carlos Delgado, he's been around great hitters, but at the end of the day, when, like I go to Don Mattingly. I always say, if I had Don Mattingly sooner in my career, I had him in New York in 2007 when he was our bench coach. And then I had him in LA as my hitting coach. And I was like, if I had Donnie at a, as, tw at a tw as a 22 year old player, I would have 1500 more hits in the big leagues because you know, it and I know there's an exception to the rule. You don't have to be an absolute stud at the major league level to be a good coach, but you also like Donnie had that unique difference to where he was a great player in his era, but he also never forgot how hard the game really was. And he never made me feel below him. And I, I, I just, I took everything Donnie said, and it was amazing to work with me playing the same position. He never made me feel below him. And he just had a knack of, of breaking stuff down and giving us an out. Like he always tell, I remember our phrase, based on Tim Lincecum in his prime. And he's like, I don't care if we swing through 15 fastballs up. I don't care. We're not going to chase the ball down. So he gave us an out to be like, okay, if we swing through a high fastball, he's not going to get mad at us. Cause he knows that if that ball is two inches lower, one of us are going to click it and it's going to be two points on the board. So that's just a little bit of a kind of like where we're getting away from. And to me going into long and involved, but where we are today, yes, the pitchers, they, everybody screams the velocity. I'm, I'm not, a, I, I know they throw harder, but it's also measured differently. Um, yeah. We, uh, the hitters have changed their swing to allow the high fastball to be successful again, because they don't care about the strikeouts. They don't care. They complain about an out all the time. And I fought that in 2012 and they're like, we don't care if they strike out. I'm like, y yes, you do. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be a point in time where we need to put a ball in play. That's going to matter. And they're not going to be able to do it. And, you know, so, you know, I think the hitters haven't adjusted back the shifts and all this stuff. I get into daily arguments all the time with people with, I go to me in retrospect, to me, it's never really been, I always feel like it's never been easier to hit 300 because they're giving you half the field. And the one thing we've learned through all this velo and being in the minor league system, they don't care about command anymore. It's just blow and go. And well, there are mistakes made down the middle of the plate that if you learned how to shorten your swing up, you could take advantage of that. Yes. Velocity is tough to hit. I get it. But movements even more, even more tough in my opinion. And if you would shorten up and you got to give to get something and the hitters aren't having to give up anything because there's no repercussions for punching out 200 times. And, you know, I, I don't blame their players. I, I, I get it. Like everybody, they, they're paid, they're getting paid to hit home runs. I get it. If you would change the whole industry and start giving, I always said this when we played, if you gave David Eckstein $20 million a year, the game would change because no one really wanted David Eckstein from April through September, but in October, everybody wanted David Eckstein because he did things right. And he did things well. And he, he made every play and he gave you a tough at bat and I get it. No one really cares about the, the average guy, but the same token, everybody's complaining about the game being too boring now because there's nothing but strikeouts, walks or homers. And yes, you need power. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it's definitely a huge part, but it's not the only part. There's other ways to score runs. Yeah, the, I was well, talking about that. The Phillies game the other night, the ball Gene Segura hit, right? A little bleeder just past the, the second baseman. You're drawing in two runs. I think last night in uh, the other night with somebody's bunting guys over, really. Right. So so it, it's there. The mentality's still there of understanding, right? Where Of, wait, this is a little bit bigger than I am. This game is, right? Because, I mean, you've, you've played on championship teams where you're not living and dying by the home run, right? I mean, you were... You, 
you're on that 04 Red Sox team and down to you're down 3 0, right? And, and you've got, you've got to, what do we do? We got to get somebody on base. You know, you're not trying to hit an eight run homer. You're just trying to get somebody on base, right? That's, that's the thing. But now it's just, all right, we're down nine runs. All right, let's try and go hit a nine run homer. If not, I'll strike out and uh, that's it. Oh, we'll go you? back to the, yeah, we're right back to the, right back to the dugout. And, it's just it's it's what's being taught. So how, how do we you know how do you get away from it? I mean, was were you given input when they said, "Hey, what are your thoughts?" Or was it just a matter of ah, you don't know anything? Move well, on. I mean, we we could give our input for sure. They wouldn't really listen to it, and they didn't like. They just say that's not that's not gonna that's not feasible. I said, well, I know I always go back to the group I had in Minnesota. It's funny I got crushed because like I the one year Molly because I man I interviewed for the big league job when Molly got it. Molitor got it in Minnesota, and I felt like that was my group. Uh, I, I basically those guys when they came to work every day. I had them for three years. By the third year, they knew what to expect from me, and they had an obligation. It was very similar to the group I came up with in Minnesota. The teams were be, were beyond awful before we got there. We, you know, I'm talking Hunter, Tory Hunter, Jock Jones, Corey Kosky, Brad Radke, Eric Milton. AJ Przinsky, like that group coming up, we had an obligation to where like we were going to bring respectability back to the city of Minneapolis. And I kind of had that group as a manager from a ball. I'm like, and I basically would harp on them every day. I don't care who we play. We're not talking about wins and losses. You guys play the way you're capable of playing. The scoreboard will dictate in the end. And they had an, like, I taught We basically, we, we learned as a group to like, I pounded on them. You guys come to the, when you, park your car and you walk through the door, you're expected to win today, period. End of story. Have that expectation. And it took a while to learn. Too many teams now don't put emphasis on winning games in the minor leagues because you're not going to learn at the big league level. Hell, my twins group that I when I was a player, we won every level except we never finished. We never won a championship. We're in the playoffs every year, all the way to the finals. And then we got to the big leagues. We lost almost 100 games. But that group never lost sight of, you know what, we're taking our lumps now. But when we when when this level becomes just a game again, we're going to return the favor and we're going to start kicking people's asses. And it's we're not going to take we're not going to feel no one's going to feel sorry for us anymore. And you kind of saw that happen. And, and I use that because when those guys came up to the big leagues, it was always, oh, man, they can't do this. They can't run the bases. All the fundamentals are gone. And I'm like, well, you brought them up from double A. The game's super fast for them. And when it slows down, you're going to be fine. Well, the next year, as much criticism as I took as a manager and a minor league developer, the next year when they made the playoffs and they went into the Yankee Stadium and had a lead, it was like, I didn't hear anything. It's like they didn't say, well, we were wrong. Doug did a good job or like our, uh, Doug, the minor league system did a job. I just feel like there's a lot of disconnect between the big leagues and the minor leagues. Everybody wants to point the finger why this kid can't do this. Well, you can't measure a kid's heart rate on a ground ball the difference between AAA and the big leagues. And it's, you know, it and I know it when the game gets faster, shit starts unraveling fast and they can't get a hold of it. And every kid goes through a different time frame of when it becomes, when it slows back down to where you can think and process information. You can't dictate that one guy might get, like, for example, Jock Jones got it immediately and was a stud from the minute he got there. Whereas it took me almost a year and a half to where I was like, okay, now it's a game again. Now it's time to start being, successful individually and then all of a sudden then the team took over and then we started winning games and and we made the playoffs almost every year so there i mean it, it, there's a there's definitely there has to be a mix of both and i always say whenever they start allowing x players to get in the front office this will start to change and we're starting to see the same folds chris young's hopefully that they, you know i always say if tory hunter could be a gm that team will be you know, like look what Derek Jeter, he was the president, owner, and he didn't like the way they were doing it. He just walked away. But that tells you right there what he's fighting against as Derek Jeter. He's the, you know, he's, my gosh, uh, next to Santa Claus, there's like, it's like Santa Claus, Derek Jeter. Everybody, whether you like him, dislike him, everybody respects him. And if they don't take his word for it, whose word are they going to take? And it's... <sighs> You're right. That the respect of the game, and that you were talking about. That's why you just, I just want to, just going to walk away from it, because it's, it's it seems like it's going to sink itself, right? Because, it, and as a coach, I mean, I'm sure like, you're at the high school level now. Are you seeing it at that level as well? Oh, it's yeah. They, they, 
uh, they're in a generation, we're in a world now where everything was at our fingertips, right? If you need something, if you, I mean, I use an example, like when we, you and I were in school, if we had to get information, we had to go to encyclopedia, figure it out. We didn't have Google at our fingertips to everything once, like there's cheat codes in PlayStation. There's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff to, to, to shorten the period of time of learning. And baseball is not just a, you know, if you expect to get this, I'm going to battle that with my own son. He's, you know, he, we're it, obviously a swing is always a work in progress. And we're trying to work on him, you know, front hip, keeping his front hip in. And it's like, if you aren't willing to take this and do small things, everybody wants to hit, everybody wants to throw harder. Everybody wants to, you know, hit the ball farther, but they're not willing to do the small little tiny increments that it takes to fix that, to allow yourself to hit the ball. Everybody wants to go throw, everybody wants to go take batting practice, but to take batting practice with a flaw, you're prolonging the agony of what the problem really is. And they're not willing to kind of break it down and be like, if you can just, I go control the controllables, right? You always hear that. Everybody uses that term to, to nausea them. Control the things you can't control. And I'm like, my son's name is Steel. I'm like, Steel, if you can control your load, which is under, which is you have control over, the rest athletic ability can take over. But if you can't control your load, we're going to have issues with this every, with, you're going to have issues when days you don't control your load, you're going to be an out wrapped in a uniform. And that's not the way this is supposed to be. If you can control your load, which is, totally in your control good things will happen more often not every time but more often but just control what you and he just you know something like how many times did you in your hotel room as a big leaguer look in the bathroom mirror and go through your stance i'm going to do it get out of the shower at 9 a.m i'm like okay i'm a little psycho but at the same token i'm like i have to fix this i know that if i don't fix this i'm going to have that sinking gut feeling again tomorrow tonight that i had last night and i don't want to do that so there's just a, you know, the, the, the willingness to, and they're not all of them. Cause I had a lot of great, a lot of my, I think my best jobs as a developer were kids that didn't play in the big leagues. Um, you know, I, was I hard on them? Absolutely. And here's a good example, like how disconnected they are with the front office to uh, some organizations. I got fired by Detroit saying, I don't discipline enough. If you ask any kid that's ever played for me, discipline was my number one thing, but yet, when I would try to sit a guy, I would get phone calls. Why isn't he playing? Why hasn't he played? And I'm like, well, because you just told me I, I, I have to, I, he missed three signs and was late to, to his early work. I'm not playing him. That's not, that, that's not how this works. There's a respect level from your teammates and your coaching staff to be there on time and be present and, and do your work. And they're like, if I sat a guy for more than a day, I would get, phone call for phone call why is he playing you got to play him you got to play the mics like or you got to play so and so in center five days if he's got to play right for three and he's got to play left for one i'm like that's nine days we only have seven in a week and he's like and then their answer would be like well you can just figure it out and then when you figure it out they don't like the way you do it so it's like which way like who am i trying to please and why like whatever happened to i have these kids every day like for example i had daz cameron uh, uh, Mike's son and he was struggling in AAA young kid he was 21 years old loved the dude to death and I put him in right field instead of center and he I think he had two home runs that game and so I put him back in right the next day and I was like let's limit let's he's getting comfortable on one side of the ball let's leave him there for a couple days and then we can start to move him back to center and not to say he couldn't play center, but he hit better and right. We're superstitious. He might have, something might have made him relax a little bit. Let's let him get rolling first, and then we'll move him back. And they're like, no, he's got to play center. You know, it's like, well, that's just a, from a thought process, there, well, I didn't just do it randomly. There was thought process behind this because I'm trying to get him to get, to feel comfortable at the plate because that's a big thing. And you always, the, the, the kids now are, if they hit, they play defense where we were on the other way, where if I'm not hitting, I felt like nobody else is like, I want like misery loves company. I was <laughs> like, if someone, if I, if I wasn't getting hits, no one else is, don't hit it near me. Cause I'm, you're out. Cause I'm going to, I have to do something to stay in the lineup. So, and that was just an example of the constant backlash of just like, like even when the kid does well, it's not, 
it wasn't right in their eyes. Well, you can't please everybody because there's too many people in the room that they listen to instead of just having, yes, you want to, I want all my coaches. If I was running an organization, I'd want to hear it from everybody. I want to know about strength coaches. They know the true heartbeat of what kids are really about, right? Do they do their work? Do they just go through the motions in the weight room? And they hear everything that goes on. Trainers and strength coaches hear everything. Yep. They know the heartbeat of everything. And I, they just, some, some places just don't listen to them. Like they know stuff that coaching staffs don't know. So why don't we use that to our advantage to figure out, you know, is he sore? The kid's going to tell you he's going to go. But if he's sore, I need to know that so I don't put him in harm's way tonight. Well, why didn't he pitch? Well, he said he was kind of sore. Well, he didn't tell it. Like I, it's just a in, it, playing the game. You have an intuition that you, you can see it when it's not right to protect the kid against themselves. So there's always been a disconnect. And that's something that I think that is a big problem with why we're seeing the product that we're seeing on the field. Yes. Individual talents are better, but it starts at, you know what? It starts at the travel ball level. Like kids don't practice. Like I, I coached the 18 U national team. The, I was part of, I was a coach on that and the decision-making process of the 18 U national team, something like base running. I was watching it and like, these kids have never been taught this. And these kids are, I mean, the elite of the elite, the top hundred high school kids in the country. And man, they're good. They're so good, but their travel ball coach for the fear of losing them on their team is not going to tell him how to properly take a lead. If it's not the way he wants to do it, he's just going to pick up his stuff and go play for somebody else. So there it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a sl slippery slope with all this stuff that they're, I always tell our kids, be careful of the information on the internet because, you know, the private coach is going to tell you how great you are. Private coaches don't make the lineup. Like th there's a reason behind it. They want your money. They don't, they're not trying to get you to perform. They're just trying to just take your money and, and not all of them, but th that's the honest to God truth. Your high school coach or your coach is going to tell you the truth because he has to win games to prove that he's the right guy for the job. So if you want the truth, start asking your coaches, not your private coach. So, um, that's part of my soapbox. And yeah, no, you're right. Because I've had, I've had kids come and, uh, you know, they're, they're, during batting practice and they say, what are you, what's going on? What are you doing? Well, my coach is doing this. I said, all right, look, we need, I need to get on the same page as your coach. We need to figure this out because like you said, you're going back and forth. He's going to do this. We're going to do this. And I, like you said, there's that disconnect of, all right, well, let's, let's figure it out. Let's see what you're actually learning and then see, okay, this is right. This is wrong. But no, because what happens is they just go say, well, my other coach said do this. Well, okay, well, are you paying him or are you paying me? So, you know, and that's what you come to. And it sounds like you are – they hire you to manage with your staff, yet you're the puppet. They want to they be the puppet master and tell you what to do. But even though they're 1,000 miles away and, like you said, an arm, arm sore, how do you know? Because I just, I just spoke to him. I saw him out there playing catch. But, well, analytics say that he can pitch two more days – Right. And that's what they're going by. They're not going off of the gut feeling, the interaction that you have as a coach. So and I'm sure it's frustrating as hell sitting there trying to do this of either let you let me do my job or just go find you know some, another baseball nerd that just can read the numbers. And that's it. And then and then see what happens. It's almost if they don't they don't trust you with, you know, with the amount of time you spent going through this, being in the major leagues, minor leagues, coaching, everything else. Well, we don't trust you fully to do. Well, then why the hell do you hire me? So I can sue your escape code. I mean, here's a good example. I, we're in Chattanooga in double A about to win a championship. And I'll go back. Minnesota would send you an email every day and it would get, it was color coded who was green, who was yellow, who was red, red mean you couldn't pitch green said you're supposed to pitch. So we put our relievers on a schedule and they were all multi. It had to be multi innings, it had to be two innings and they get two days off. And it was the same way in AAA. And I'm like, well, what's the number one important thing about being a big league reliever? Well, it's durability. And two, if they can't, as soon as you get to the big leagues, they're throwing them back to back days. Well, they've never done that in the minor leagues. So how do you expect, how do I know what he's going to do the second day if he's never done it? So it's foreign to him. The level's foreign to him. Now the situation, the, the way we're using them is foreign. And I, and it goes back into, I remember the championship game. I got, I had two closers at that level and they said they only had 15 pitches. Well, I'm like, okay, 
but some of like one of them, it took them 15 pitches just to get loose in a game. And I'm like, so this is a championship game. They don't, they have six months of rest. I would never overuse a guy to win a game, but I'm like, I would have to call in the fifth inning. Is he available? Can I use him? Well, he's, he's yellow. So I'm like, well, if this is the last game of the year, if I need one out, can I bring him in? No, but you can't take, you can't send him back out there. I'm like, okay. So now I'm running through and that's the, where it goes back where one guy's exposable. The other guy is, is, is the bubble wrap guy. And I said, I had a guy that uh, Jake reads his name and he he's in the big leagues. He's pitched up and down. He's kind of a, 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 a up and down guy, but best kid on the planet. And he was a two inning guy, 97. But every time he made a mistake, he got blasted and he was a movement guy, but yet he'd go out there full of piss and vinegar and his ball would flatten out. And I was like, okay, can't we, can we try to throw him one inning today, one inning tomorrow? He's a guy, in my opinion, I've had him for three years. He's going to be better the second day because he's not 100%. He's not 120 every time. He's not a bull in a china shop. He has some feel to his stuff the second day, and I think he's going to be more successful. You're better off sending up Jake Reed and letting them use him two, three, two, three days in a row than you are making them go two innings, sit two days, throw two innings. And that's kind of the, like that's another just example of the disconnect between what we try to do and like, not a, there's exception to every rules, but you can't just justify, have them on schedule. And then all of a sudden in the big leagues expect it's like utility guys. You don't know if they're going to be a good utility guy in the big leagues. They play every day in the minor leagues. Then you get to the big leagues. You're playing once every five days. Well, he can't hit. Well, the big leagues is hard to do every day, let alone once every five days. So I don't know. You're, you're in a different, he's in a different role than what we're using them. So you never really know what you get, but like we don't do a good job in my opinion, of preparing them for what reality is up there because no one's seen reality. You look at the coaches now. There's more big league coaches or pro ball coaches in college and more college coaches in pro ball. Well, this ain't college. We don't get three days off. We It's it's a daily grind. We got to figure this out today. And and I think that's where like you lose the disconnect because when you get to the big leagues, there's a lot of it that you know this. Like It's mental. It's like, how do I approach it at that? You know, like what, what should I be looking for? Don't give me, oh, it's 94 with a 2,400 RPM slider until I see it with my own eyes. I have no idea what that looks like. I can watch all the film I want until I'm actually standing down the barrel of a gun at 60 feet, six inches. I don't know what it looks like. And that's the, I think the disconnect with they, you don't have any personal experience. And if you do, they don't really take it into account to use it at, for your advantage because you had it in the minor leagues well you want to know what the next level is all about you want to know stories you like that's what that's what passing the baton is all about at for sports i don't want a guy who's never done it before i want a guy who's actually been there understands what i'm going through mentally to help me get through it i don't want a guy to sit there and spit out well you know the last two weeks you're three for 15 and you're swinging it i go i know that i'm living it i get it but how do i fix it and they're like, well, you're going to have to ask that guy. And then it's like, well, it, he didn't fix it. These are the problems. I've never seen an analytic number or a chart actually spit out, okay, this is what he's doing, and here's how to fix it. That's what you need us for, but you don't want to hear it from us. So that's kind of where, you know, that's kind of the frustrating part. Or if they do, you know, he's got to hit more fly balls. I'm like, what? Like, huh? Why do you want to hit more fly balls? Like, that's like – not a lot of fly balls drop in the, in the big leagues. They just, you know, it's like you're trying to teach a five, eight shortstop to sit there and back leg shit. And I'm like, that's not, that's really not how we're trying to teach this. That's the whole launch angle craze. And like, I got my kids in high school doing, I'm like, you can't hit the ball in the infield. Like your pop-ups go to the shortstop. You know, Josh Donaldson's goes over the trees. He's a grown man with ex- exceptional swing plane and all this other stuff. And there's a difference between swing thought and what actually happens to a swing. And, you know, or Josh has that thing where he's like, if your coach tells you to hit, stay on top of the ball, tell him he's, he's lying or he's, you know, tell him, tell him to shut up, which if you watch Josh's swing, that might be what he's telling himself. And I, yeah, I told myself some outlandish stuff, but that's not what I was doing, but that's what he might have to think to make it work. But his swing is flat as flat as they come at that level. Now, um, so that's where the disconnect is. And, and, you know, you get these social media gurus who, you know, read it in a book somewhere or they want to, they want to claim it to stay on Aaron judge. Well, Aaron judge was six foot 
seven, 300 and, you know, 250 pounds of just, he's like a dinosaur. You know, it's like, I had him in the, I coached against him in the minor leagues. Like this dude's a man child. Like he's going to get it. You know, you have to, he's that big. He's strong. He's a good dude. He, he's a great teammate. Guys love playing. Like this guy's going to be a, the man, but like, not everybody can do that. Not everybody six, seven, two sixty can flick a ball out to the upper deck and right center. So th- there's too much. I think mass teaching is not where we would try to make it. And that's kind of where I, I knew I went wrong, but I, I, it was done to me as a minor league player. So I was meaning like I had John Russell. Um, I have funny thing is I had his son, the 18 U team stone, which he's a stud on the way to come up. He'll probably be a first rounder, but uh, John did. John Russell was he's a Baltimore's bench coach forever. Coached the pirate, managed the Pirates, caught Nolan Ryan's no hitters. Um, he did what was right by me. He didn't do, let's just say, according to Hoyle, what the organization wanted. Like he did that for me, for my swing. I'm gonna shut up. And I felt like I had that obligation as a coach. Like I want my kids to get the best out of themselves as they possibly could. Maybe the way that we were teaching the masses of the organization wasn't quite everything they wanted, but you and I both know if they put numbers up, they're going to love it. They don't know. They don't care how the process was. They care what the results are. And uh, that's kind of how I went about my manager, my managing like or coaching or development kids. I was like, even if it's not the way they kind of want it, I have an obligation to the parents and everybody and the kid themselves to get the most out of themselves. And that's kind of where, you know, I, I, early in my career, I went wrong a few times and I, you know, I always tell the story, Corey Seager. I'll never forget this. I had Corey Seager in Ogden, Utah. He was his rookie. He just came out of the draft and, uh, he was, he had his arm real barred out. His front arm was barred out his hands way back. And we weren't supposed to touch them like the whole season, just let them play last as a half season, whatever. And Johnny Washington, I think, I, I, I'm not sure where he's at now. I think he's in Chicago. I'm not sure. But one of the great minor league, one of the greatest coaches I've ever been able to work with. He talked to him and said, hey, well, I want you to go talk to Doug real quick. And because we talked about what, what you would do with the fix it and just kind of walk away from his hands. And I put him on a tee about 20 minutes before a game. And I said, but I just, he was like, what would you do if you, if you were had freedom to, to work with me? And I said, well, I'd start your hands a little closer. And, you know, as you step, we'd just walk away from your hands and get to that position, but just with some movement, he hit like five balls off the tee with his hands, starting his hands, walk away, bam. And he goes, man, that feels really good. And I go, I go, yeah. He goes, you know what? My brother, I think his name's Kyle. He was yep. just signed a $90 million contract. He's like, man, my brother's been telling me to do that for years. I go, look, ding dong your brother's an all-star like a perennial all-star at third base in the big leagues why wouldn't you listen to him before you listen to me and the funny thing is his first at bat he goes right into the game with it hits a ball oppo over like the netting in in uh helena in left center and he's like yeah i think that works pretty good i was like yeah i think it worked too and the funny part about it was these kids sometimes don't even listen to their own brother who was an all-star with the big leagues. Like that's, you know, and that's kind of where like, it just, it's mind numbing, but that was just like the personal stories that like you can't put on paper. You can't put on, uh, you can't quantify it. I mean, look at last night's game, like Musgrove's dealing because his RPMs were up on his breaking ball. Everybody thinks he's cheating. It's like, well, no, there's adrenaline that you can't match in October. And, you know, he's pitching for his hometown team. It's an elimination game. You know, how about he's just really good tonight? Like, th- that shit happens from time to time. And, you know, he was locating. And, yeah, his shit was electric. And that's why he dominated. Not just – it wasn't because his ears were red or because he had shit on the ball. It's like, no, he just was a man on a mission. So, like, there's always got to be – you know, there's – I guarantee you there's five, you know, computer guys back there reading out all this rap Soto stuff. And they're like, well, this is different. Well, yeah, they they don't understand that because they've never had that at bat in October when it's winter go home and you really want to keep playing. Yeah, the adrenaline that's flowing and you're you know, you're in New York and all those people are saying that the same thing. But analytics thinks that that's just that's just a part of our, there's there's no feel to it. That's what they want to take out of the game. You know, you talk about these players now. 
I always tell people, I say, kids nowadays, they're, they're reactive. They're not proactive. It's almost as if you said they have to be told what to do as opposed to just saying, hey, guys, look, is this, try, let's try this, right? They'll try it for a swing or something, and then if you're gone, it's kind of, I'll go back to what I was doing because it's almost the respect of, of what we've been through and tried to teach. They don't, they don't agree with it, right? It's almost as if I've, I've, what I'm starting to learn now is the best way to get through to them is to ask, them, well, what did you feel? Let them give them the decision mm-hmm. because it seems like nowadays, even in schools, they're taking away their creativity. They're not giving them the chance to actually respond. It's, they're just being told as opposed to saying, well, what are your thoughts, right? And most kids, you know, if you're talking to your dog, just tilt their head as if, wait, you're asking me a question. And most of them don't know the answer, right? Because they're afraid, well, uh, I've never had that opportunity. And I think that's what we've gotten away from is giving them the opportunity too, because that then they're more likely to say, "Well, this," and then because then, then they'll probably come back and say, "Well, what do you see?" I say, "Okay." Now, then they're more inclined to want to listen as opposed to being told, because you know, think about it. when we were kids, we were told what to do. What, what were you told about? You can go pound sand until right your parents tell you, "Well, it's going to be like this." No, it's not, and, it, and you get to that point in your life, and you go, "Oh yeah, they were right." That's the number one question I always used to ask my guys. Okay. How did that like? What did that feel like? And I want you to sp- like. I want. I don't want the. I don't want the. What you think the coach answer should be? I want to know from your heart what it is. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll never forget this. I said I had that group for so long. Max Kepler is an outfielder. Um, basically, he. I remember he made a mistake in the big leagues, and Paul Molitor was the manager. And Paul called me, and he's like, "I can't get Max to play. Like he just he's timid." And I said. Paul, I said, because Paul is very a, a thinker, right? He was very, he was, you know, he he was great. He'd be a great manager for a bunch of veterans, right? Who just you just let him play, right? Mm-hmm. Well, a, a good example of that. Well, if, if Max screwed up on the bases, right? I'd be in the dugout. I'd like, he'd come back and I'd go to him immediately. And be like, okay, what'd you see? What was your thought process? Okay, like, and then we talk about it and we fix it. Whereas in the big leagues, Paul was different in that regard, and not saying he was wrong, but it was. I go, Paul, Max would go down to the end of the bench. And in Max's mind, you not say anything to him. Max is down there thinking, oh, my gosh, he's going to send me down. Oh, my gosh, Paul hates me. I really screwed up. And I go, that's not what you're thinking, Paul, because you're trying to do the professional thing or just let him go. We'll talk about it later. I go, you go back to the old adage of wait till you're like, I always say this. We lost youth when the statement wait till your father comes home, lost its muster. And that's, I use that because when, when you, you screwed up with your mom and your mom said, wait till your father comes home, you were scared to death because you know you don't want to disappoint dad. Dad might smack you. Dad might get on you. And then when dad comes home, it's not as bad as you made it out in your mind. And I use that analogy with Paul. I was like, Paul, you have to just go talk to him. He's dying inside because he thinks you, really don't like him as a player and that's the farthest thing from the truth just go ask him what did you see what did you feel that it's a better way to attack that that situation with a guy like max and i learned that two years into it because i was the same way with max and i wasn't getting anywhere i was running my head into a wall but the whole adage of what did you feel how did you like what did that feel like you tell me it's like a hitting coach coming in a new hitting coach right you're hitting in the cage in the minor leagues or the big leagues and they come in and just start spitting stuff at you like you, like as a player, you're like, stop. I don't, I don't ever want to see that guy ever again. So whenever you'd see that guy walking towards you and you had a bat in your hand, you'd go walk to another cage. Like, oh, guy's coming to me. Whereas if you come in and just kind of watch for a while, like I need to see what you do. I need to see what makes you click. I need to figure out what makes you click as a human before I can fix your baseball swing. And I remember kids like, well, I, I just wanted to go, oh, no, I just asked, like, how was your day? I'm not talking about your swing. I'm not talking about what just happened. Like, what have you been doing? Like, what do you like to do? I'm like, well, I like to spit on like I, I like to hit the ball the other way. I'm like, I didn't say a word about your baseball. I need to figure out what makes you click, what makes you, you know, triggers you to fix what it is. I need to know your personality before I fix your swing. If I come in here and just start spitting out terms to you, like, I'm going to lose you before I ever started. But I have to like gain rapport with you first. And I think that's part of it that we lose it. We lose these kids because everybody, every young coach or every coach that doesn't really have any truly belief in what he wants, he wants to spit information and spit out terms to these kids to make them sound smart. 
they're not trying to fix. They're just trying to make themselves sound smart. And I think a lot of parents are buying into this crap and it's like, cause they don't know any better. You just want your best for your kids. And I understand that part of it, but like, I need to figure out there's a million ways to tell you something to get the point across. And I think going long and involved, I don't think kids have a really good idea of like what their bodies really do. And that's, I don't know about you, but I, I would just watch other people do things and I try to emulate it, like screwing around a wiffle ball in the backyard. Like I'm going to hit like Daryl Strawberry or I'm going to hit like George Brett or I'm going to hit like Don Mattingly. And we just kind of played with stuff and just, that's kind of how we morphed into like, I was fortunate enough to play for some of the best coaches in the world. I had Rich Hoffman, who was a Hall of Fame high school coach, Coach Mike Martin at Florida State, um, Ron Gardenhire, Tom Kelly. The list goes on and on. You know what I learned about – I tell my son this. I go, you know what I learned from Coach Hoffman and Coach Mike Martin? And the list goes on. Uh, some of the greatest coaches that played at, at coach in high school and in Division One baseball. I go, nothing. Like, they didn't teach me anything offensively. Like, that – like you're waiting for this magical unicorn to show up and touch you and fix it. It doesn't work that way. Not this sport. There's too much, there's too much variables in it where it's just nothing but fixing something and having a determination to say, okay, I'm not going to do this again. And then go from there. It's like, they keep waiting for this magical touch or saying that's going to fix everything. When at the end of the day, it's just, you goes back to, you get what you put in. And, and that's kind of where everybody wants Everybody wants the glory, but they don't want to. They don't want to shovel the you know what to get there, and that's kind of where. And that goes from the big leagues on down to, you know, the travel ball era. Oh, absolutely! You know, our day, all they see is what's on TV. They don't see the other, you know, seven eight hours of work. You know, spring training, they see the games. They don't see the stuff you're doing in the morning, the extra work. You're in the cage. You walk over there and do it. It's the, that generation. Just well, I watch it on TV, so automatically I'm better. You know, it's, it's, I do the same thing with my son. You know, you, you like pitching? Well, then go f- – who do you want to pitch like? What do you want to do? Find out. Go watch a Greg Max. Go ra- go watch somebody that actually was able to move the ball. Is that what you're interested in? Or, or you know, depending on how you throw, you, you can find anybody that throws that way, and you can sit there and watch it. But, no, they're more concerned with watching somebody shoot three-pointers and, and – wait – you're the trying to be shots. baseball. Yes. What do you, yeah, just, and that's what I mean. It, but it's, and there, and these gurus and these, co- they try and teach one way as to do it. Right. It's mm-hmm. you're six foot eight. You want to teach somebody to hit like, like Frank Howard or, or, or Aaron judge and, uh, or, you know, but you can't, right. You, you found somebody, right. Because you watched, you found a Don Mattingly to, to be able to do that, to watch, you know, I was, I was around, you know, Juan Gonzalez, Alex Pudge, watching those guys just taking different bits and pieces of it. But, but what was I doing? I think the biggest thing is what I was engaged in it, right? I was watching the game happen. You know, you've, you know, I don't know when you were coaching, if they were still, they started with the iPads in the dugout, you know, watching video. I mean, you're not even engaged to the game unless you're, right. unless it's your turn to play, unless you're on the field and there's no interaction, right? It's gone. There, there's no, you know, there's no, you know, even if it's a bad, you get in there, right? You go stand next to somebody, you start talking. You don't go right to the video and just watch and then basically seclude yourself from everybody else. You, you do it. You're there. You're there together. And I think that's that disconnect you talk about. It starts. It's even with the players, too. Like the one thing I tell our kids about, like, because I obviously love Aaron Judge, which who doesn't? I mean, he's the year he had was nothing short of miraculous. Um, but I'm like, I go, you know what? And I tell our kids and even because I coach a bunch of other teams. You know, the one thing that sticks out to me about Aaron Judge, and they're like, the home runs, I'll go, no. Every time they pan the dugout, where is he? He's on the top step, staring at the pitcher. I said, that's, like, he's engaged. And, like, and I, I you know, that's, they like, they like, huh, that really makes sense. I'm like, yeah, because little stupid stuff. Like, I'm coaching third at a high school game. My high school team, my dugout's on the third base side. And, you know, the, the, the mind never stops, right? I'm, I, I'm not, I'm watching the pitcher pitch and I'm like, I can tell when he's going to throw a fastball. I can tell when he's going to throw a curveball. And, you know, I had this in high school. I had this in pro ball up to AAA. If my dugout was on the third base side and I found something and they wouldn't believe me. And I'd be like, I would spit out 12, 14, 17 pitches in a row. And be just like slider, fastball, fastball. And I was like, and they'd be like, how are you getting it? I go, I'm just watching what's in front of me. Like, like, and it goes back to the iPads. I, my double A, my last year in double A with the twins, 
we started bringing iPads into the, and it gave every kid got an iPad. And I was like, and I told them, I said, okay, but I, I'm keeping the iPads and they, it drove them nuts because it was supposed to be for the kids and they carry it everywhere. And, and which is great in theory, but these kids are 20, 22 years old. You think they forget their gloves on road trips. You think they're going to remember where an iPad is that was given to them. So, and the idea of me taking all the iPads was I wanted, if they want to work or look at their at bats or look at their swing they have to come to me to get it so a coach is watching it with them. This is not going to be the, you know, I got an iPad to watch the, the dig me tapes. Like, okay, like we're going to actually use these as a tool for what they were given to us for. But to sit there and just dissect and, and dissect your own swing when you don't really know what you're looking for is not a positive thing either. So you know, that's, that's kind of where, we, and like the one thing I will say about the iPads, you see them on the bench today. It sure does. Uh, it, one thing it has cured because there were times when I would, I'd get called up to the big leagues to coach in September. And like, you'd look in between innings and there's like three people on the bench because they're all in the video room. And that's the one thing it stopped. At least the kids are in the dugout. But like, if you just watch what's in front of you, you'll learn a lot of information of what's going on, the stuff you're going to need to know. I, mean, I, I had to go through how to stand on deck in the minor leagues, like what to think, what to process. I use an example. I hit behind, I, I watched Derek. I played with Derek in New York and like, I'll never forget this. I was watching, he was on deck and a righty, someone was throwing and someone threw a ball up and into the guy that was hitting and Derek moved out of the way. And I'm like, Damn, like that's how engaged he is. And he's not even hitting yet, but that's, he was acting like it was his at bat and the ball came up and in and he reacted to it. And I was like, that sticks out or I got to teach kids from high school all the way to triple A. Like when you're on deck, stop turning towards the stands and actually watch what's going on. You might pick something up. You might find something that you didn't see five minutes ago that might help you in the at bat you're about to have. Cause you always like, they always get mad. Like I go, this is the feeling you have when you made the out that burning oh, feel you have when you make an out, that feeling should kind of enter you on deck as you're walking to the on deck circle. Like, I don't want to have this feeling again. So let's do something different than what we just did when we give our kids, give it a pass away. But that's kind of like, it's kind of a backwards way of thinking about it, but like that burning anger you have when you fail Let's try to have that. Don't don't focus on it, but remember the feeling so you don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. You're right, and you talk that that's the stuff. That, but and we knew though what the feel was. Wait, that didn't feel right. You know, we'll go to the, if and if we would go to the cage, it would be hey, you know, hey Rudy, let's can we go in the cage? Yeah, sure, let's go. I'm feeling mm -hmm. something. What are you noticing? Right, you you would actually ask and gay, and then they would they would tinker with something if it was if going on right sometimes a lot of times though it's just it's more mental it's what's, what's between our ears we just oh, you're just thinking too much what do you mean you basically turn your brain off right yeah. and there's, that's the thing and some, it's, yeah yep but no exactly. guys go in there for for an hour and they're just hitting and hitting off the what are you what are you doing what are you, what are you like uh, michael young right he, yeah. i use that line all the time in the minor leagues it's like michael young had probably arguably one of the best statements to ever been said in sports big league hitters hit to get it right minor league hitters hit to get it wrong. And like, like my high school level, like they're, I'm going through, they only, they only want to work in front of a coach. And I'm like, if you just only want to work in front of a coach, you're never going to get better. Like, like there's, there's 20 players and two or three coaches. Have you ever played on a team that had a coach as many coaches as players? No. So you have to do some things without the coach staying over your shoulder. And I said, guys, you go in there and hit yourself into a coma. And like, you got in there, you found it right. You got, you fixed it. And then you wanted 55 more swings. And now you're right back to where you were before you entered it. Whereas I tell my own son, I was like, if you hit 10 line drives off the tee, off the back net, on a line with backspin, no hook, no slice, bye. Like, you're done. Go. You're ready but you want to take 25 more and then you hit one and roll one over. Then you push one. Now you're scrambling 
Whereas that's what Michael Young was talking about. A big league hitter, I would tell my son that when I was the pinch hitter in Pittsburgh, I'd get ready for my bat and I'd go in the cage. I'd put the ball in the outer third of the plate, kind of up on the top of the zone. If I back spun it off the back net, I just like, all right, man, see ya. Like, thanks. I'd thank the hitting coach and be like, I'm good. I can't do it better than that. I, I, all I can do is screw it up from there. I'm confident. I'm ready. I'm like, guys, if you just show, it shows confidence. If you hit three, four, five balls in a row on the line and you just walk out, you think you're worried about, oh, well, my coach told me I had to take seven swings. You don't have to. If you hit three line drives in a row and you feel confident, get out. It shows confidence. You know, it's like that's what this game is all about. And that's kind of where they just want uh, they want constant pats on the back. And this is not the sport for you if you can't deal with fatigue and you can't deal with failure. It's just like, you know, you talk, you talk about going to the batting cage. You don't need a coach there. You can tell by the sound if you're doing it right and doing it wrong. And, and that's what I teach some of these kids. Do you, do you hear that sound? Does that sound different than the other one? Well, yes. Well, that's the sound you're looking for. So you don't need us to hold your – because you're, you're not. You're not – coaches aren't going to be in there holding your hand in the box, right? You're not – if you're at Yankee Stadium, there's 60,000 people. Your dad's not going to be over there telling you what to do in the box. You know what it's supposed to be like. But you're right. These kids just seem to be – that I need more reinforcement and, and I need you to pet. No. Oh, they go to the, they go to different they go to separate they go to different private coaches because they keep waiting to hear you know they want to hear oh how great he is but then it's like <laughs> you have to have that same ability and it goes back to what you just said I always tell our guys the flight of the ball never lies the flight of the ball will tell you everything you need to know about what you're doing and what went wrong right if you hit off the tee the ball's not moving if you hook it you probably leaked if you sliced it you pulled out or you bat drug or, you know, you're pulling off a little bit. I go, that tells you everything. Just like the sound, the flight of the ball never lies. And it will tell you and to teach them. And that's kind of what I went back to is goes back to analytics and stuff like that, was I want to explain to them why their ball did such and such. And, um, you know, I remember I, just stories keep popping in my head. I have Nico Goodrum, who's now a, he's in the big leagues with the Astros, utility guy, but he spent some time, second round pick, athletic as hell. Um, took a while to get it, but I had him in double A. He spent, I think, three or four years in Detroit as a big leaguer and had some pretty good years. And 6'3", uh, perfect body, just great kid, grinder, worked his ass off. And I was in double A with him. And two things stuck out. And I go, hey, all right, do me a favor. Here's a tee. Put the ball. If you could call timeout and say, I want it right here and tell him, I want you to throw it right here. I go, just put it where you want it. And he did that thing where you just did where you tilted your head to me. You're like, he looked at me like I had three heads and I was like, no, just put the ball exactly where you want it. He didn't know. And I'm like, okay, Nico, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I go, that's honesty, bud. And that's the stuff that you're not going to get into a mat. Like he, if he's around his boys, he's not going to get, have the, the, you know, no one wants to sound stupid, but it's like, Nico, like I'm that I'm so grateful that you said that to me because now I know why we're having trouble getting you over the hump as a hitter. You don't know where you want the ball. And if I didn't know that, someone's gonna keep spitting out terms to you when it doesn't matter because you don't really know what and I explained to him, hey, okay, this is where I would think you would want the ball. And he hit a couple of balls like, yeah, that's, that's, I go, but see, that's the part of, you know, that if you don't have that interaction or that trust in your own ability as a coach to not spit out book terms to him and be like, let's break it down. The simplest of, I always say this at the end of the day, you don't, if you are where we're losing the game, in my opinion is these kids always want to have some you know terminology, launch angle, all this crap. When in the reality is, the nature of baseball or anything is you're six years old. You're in the backyard with your best friend and you're playing wiffle ball. You tap the plate. All you want to do is either hit a ball over a fence or off your buddy who's throwing the wiffle ball at you. You didn't care where your hands were. You didn't care where you got your foot down. You just want to hit a missile. And that's what this game is all about. It's just competition. And when we bog these kids down with so much data and information, we're losing the ability to just tap the plate and let's just get after it and see what happens. Cause the quicker you do that, all the other stuff kind of falls in line. And that's, you know, that's what you, you can make it as complicated as you want, but 
simplicity is a wonderful thing. And if you can just, the simpler you can make it, the faster you're going to have success and the more sustained success you're going to have. Yeah. And that, and we were hitting everything and anything, whether it was a rock, an acorn, you know, somebody throw, Hey, here's, here's a soccer ball. Let's hit that. Whatever. It was, it was something, it didn't matter what it was, right? You were just, Correct. you were out there doing it and you weren't, you wanted to hit. Yeah. You were just having fun. It didn't matter what it was, a piece of ice. Right. right, you were hitting whatever it is you could, but it, like you were talking about with, with that kid. It's but they're afraid to make a mistake. Like, oh my gosh, if I'm wrong, but and that's what I mean. It, it, that starts at this younger age of just you're, it's okay. You're going to be wrong. It builds character. I mean, you baseball is a great sport. You fail seventy percent of the time, and you're considered a hall of famer. At this rate, right. they're going to be failing eighty five percent of the time with the way they're being taught. Uh, right. right. So I mean, well, it's, I'm, uh, competitive wise too. That's kind of where I'm going. Like. The travel ball era is like every every kid plays shortstop, right? I mean, I went through out of the ATU team. We were doing infield drills, and there's a hundred kids there, and no one wanted to play first. And I'm like, well, someone's gonna have to play on this team. And then they're like, they all wanted to go to shortstop, right? Well, little Joey at eight years old, like he might be on the same team with another really good shortstop. And instead of making little Joey play second or third to play on the team, we just take little Joey to the travel ball down the street who doesn't have a shortstop so he can play shortstop so therein lies part of the game where i played every position on the planet growing up i just I just i learned how to catch i learned how to play third i learned how to play shortstop yeah i wanted to play short but hey that kid's better than me i'm gonna go play second or i'm gonna go play first or i'll play left and i think you learn more obviously you learn more about the game from different angles if you play other positions you know responsibilities you know hey this goes here that guy goes there well, if we just keep making it easier to where little Joey is only going to play shortstop and we keep moving him, two things happen. He loses the really important years to understand the game at a, at a younger level to understand the game to help him be a better high school player and college player or whatever. And we also lose the fact that like, hey, there's a, there's a competition factor where if you don't want if, – if you think you're better than the guy playing short, stay on the team and prove it. Like you can play your ass off at third or second and do some things where the coach would be like, well, okay, well maybe we should put him at short and move the other guy. Instead, we just remove the competition part of it and put him over on a team who doesn't have a shortstop so we can play shortstop. So you're, you're aiding and embedding this whole, like, if I don't like it where I'm at, I can just, I don't need to compete. I just need to, I just need to get removed and, and, and go play somewhere else. And that's kind of the part of, you know, that's, that's a character builder. Um, just because you didn't get exactly what you wanted, there's nothing wrong with that. Like there's like you know with the transfer portal and you but know that's what this they're and being that. fed it's though just... today. That's the, that's what the, you know this this nil rule. Think about it. when we were in college, we we couldn't even work. Right now they're offering kids money. How's I don't know how this isn't tampering or recruitment. Where okay, you know the nil. Okay, you're getting paid money to be to be an athlete. And, you know, the transfer poll that you talked about, right? If we went D1 mm -hmm. to D1, you had to sit out of here. Now you don't have Correct. to sit out. I'm even hearing wind that they're going to, they want to change that terminology to go where you can change every year. So you could be at four different schools in four years if somebody hurts your feelings. So it, it basically they're just catering to this. It's okay if the, somebody hurt your feelings. I mean, coaches are getting fired because somebody hurt their feelings. I mean, that's what right. they're, that's what they're teaching now. They're not teaching respect. They're not teaching any kind of integrity. They're not teaching these kids to, to, to put the work in, you know, it's not all, you know, roses and everything else. There's going to be blood and there's going to be sweat. and There's going to be tears, but that's a part of it. But now the it's like they're running the asylum. Exactly. And that's, and that's, and, that's, and I, I go back to, I'll never forget that. We had a kid by the name of Minnesota. We had a kid Cole Stewart. We were supposed to play football at A&M with Manziel, a quarterback, first rounder. I loved him. He had a bulldog mentality. He was a little off, but you know, it's okay. That's, that's just, he had some moments and some things, but like I got to know him as a player and the idea, the, the story goes back to where he was a first rounder and he wanted to do his own workout routine. And I was like, no, like make, make him do. If you believe in our workout routine, which we have 300 players who we make them do it, what makes him different? And they're like, well, you're going to lose them then. I go, we don't like they, if you sign a contract for the, in the minor leagues, you're there for six years. They don't dictate what they do. We dictate what they don't like our system. What are they going to do? Sit out and they're going to sit out for five years before they can pick up with somebody else. We have, like, we trust our system. We trust, we supposed to draft into our system. 
Like if you want, you know, if you're looking for big power guys, then stop drafting the five foot six, 165 pound kid to work into our system. So and that's my point was it was no knock against Cole because Cole wanted to try different things. And I have nothing wrong with that. I go, but if you want to do extra, if you want to do your workout on the side, that's a whole other topic. But you're going to do, because we've developed players from day one, we've been doing this a lot longer than you have. And if you start doing it, if you let Cole do it, then three other kids are going to want to do their own thing. Now we've lost any sense of structure. It's like they we have a way we want to do things. We believe in how we do it. As a, as a whole, yes, we can get individual with specific stuff, like how he holds a slider or whatever. But like you're talking mass stuff like workout routines and, and regiments, they don't have another choice. Like they make them do what we believe in because we took you for a reason because you fit into what we want to do. And that and I would fight that all the time. I was like, and that's what happened. You lost it. The inmates have the chance to run the asylum. And then now, now it's like, no wonder they don't listen to us because we, we haven't given them any a reason for, we haven't given them any repercussions for not like not attentive to the authority. And that's kind of where, you know, it's a slippery slope and there's always an exception to the rule, but at the same token, you're like, man, like you wonder, you don't, don't question when we are, why we lost it. We know exactly why you just don't want to admit it because you were the one that was pushing him to let this kid do what he wanted to do. And, and that's, that's exactly right. Like if like you hurt your feelings, well, I hate to break it to you. Like I always go back to that, not a huge fan of Nick Saban, but I respect what the hell he's done and how, and how he coaches and that thing where like passion, I, I, not word for word, but he's like, some of you might think this is wrong, but this is just passion. Like, this is what passion looks like, you know, like, like that's, it's a meme somewhere. And I was like, that's exactly right. People always say, well, you're angry all the time and you yell. I go, well, I'm just passionate about what I do. And I care about what, how my kids do. I care about their success because I want them to have the same, you know, same experiences I had. No one wants to play a sport with their, no one ever says like, Why'd you play basketball? Well, I really, really bad at it. So I kept playing it. You know, they don't, no one does that. So um, I want them to have success, but at the same token, it's my responsibility to teach you. It's your responsibility to ask questions if it doesn't make sense, but there's a, there's a give and take here. I can be, and this is goes, I go back to Paul Molitor. And I was like, uh, Paul was, I always joked and called him Yoda of baseball. Like I thought I paid attention to the game as a player like Paul took it to a whole nother level. It doesn't matter if you can be Yoda. If your student's not willing to accept the information or understand it, it doesn't matter what you're telling them. So, um, you know, like to, you know, you're not going to tell a nine-year-old kid the same thing you're telling a high school, a high school senior. It's just, there's two different things. Like there's different terminology. You got to like lack of a term, dumb it down, but you also have to be able to, get your information across. And I think that's where part of like these internet gurus that they don't, if you ask them a question of why they don't even have the answer because they just, you know, get, get behind it and lift it, get behind it, get behind it. what they see is what not really what they, I, I go back to David Ortiz. Everybody sees the big whirly bird lean back. Da, da, da. I go look at still pictures of when Griffey hit, like he gets into his front side, his back foot's off the ground. Like he's not, you see the after where they lean back for the pretty baseball card picture. That's not what they're doing. Well, if you don't actually understand that the kids see oh, everybody's back legging and sweeping it straight up. And I'm like, that's not what's actually happening. So, you know, that's, I, I can't, it's, it's a, it's a really tough time to, and I feel bad for the players. I really do because they're looking for truthful guidance and truthful information and it's just it's not out there like it should be it's like that's you know like you said it earlier about your private lessons and i have kids that are, go to private guys which i have no problem with i go but i'll tell you what if you have a private guy let me have his number and i want to know what you guys are working on and it has nothing to do with for me i want to know what you're saying to him that way i'm not contradicting what if it, if he's working and he you feel like you're getting better with him, good, great, that's perfect. But I don't want to be 
contradicting what he's telling you. So now you're totally confused of what's going on. And I go, if he has a problem talking to me, then he's insecure about what he's actually telling you. So if, the, if he truly believes in what he's doing is fixing you, he'll have no qualms about telling me exactly what he's doing with you. And I've had coaches who are like, they won't talk to me because they're afraid of, you know, maybe being wrong or they're intimidated. But it's like, at the end of the day, I'm not like, I'm not getting a million dollar raise. If we go 20 and four this year, I just want my kids to get better. And that's, you know, that's what goes back to passion. And it's like, I think some of the coaches and sadly, most of the coaches that some have still have the passion, but I don't ever want to do something just because it's, it's sending me a paycheck. I don't want to just clock in and clock out and see you later. That's not, that's not what's going to make the kid better. Like I, I mean, hell I'm coaching a really bad high school team and I stay up at night and I wake up at three o'clock in the morning to run out here and start jotting down thoughts that I have to fix a certain kid. And that's just, to me, that's what's lost in all this is that the, the passion for at least the, the, the experience I had, the passionate ones are the ones that are, that are getting let go. And the ones that truly are doing it, you know, just to, save face and to keep their job which is everybody has their reasoning but i wasn't going to be one of those guys that was like if i'm, I'm not going to teach something i truly don't believe in and that's kind of where I, I i can honestly say for a couple spots a couple stops i went that ain't for me like i, I i'm not i'm not doing that because that that i know in my heart that's not what's gonna make these kids better yeah good and that's just that's the respect you have for yourself for the game and for the guys that you know the guys that came before you of knowing that that's what we're here tr trying to pass that on to this generation. But it's, you talked about, you know, it's almost as if nowadays when you know, I'm looking at the picture behind you from that 04 world series team, and then, you know, that gold medal game in, in 2000 of, of being in a boat together. Now, you know, the, you guys are all paddling in the same direction. Now it seems like you've got there. Everybody's paddling a different direction, showing them well, what does that mean? Coach? Well, it means you, the boat is just going in circles. It's not going to go anywhere. And that's, right. the, that's what you're, like you said, that's what you've been trying to do. And it's if now, nah, Doug, that's not, that's not going to work. We, we don't want what you have. To, just we'll take what you take with a grain of salt and then we'll move on. But, and that's, what's forcing these guys out. So you, I don't know, is the game going to sink itself? I don't know. It's, but it's not headed in the right direction. That's for sure. And it's, and you know, you sit, we sit there on social media and we sit there and watch it and even watching game. They're even hard to watch. Baseball's even hard to watch. Uh, you, 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 and I always said this, and I, I, I use this as a, as, as part of like what made me survive as long as I did in the big leagues was if I tell our kids, if you wrap yourself up in the game, wrap yourself up in the game you're playing now and you do what the game tells you to do, you'll never be wrong. It doesn't mean you'll execute it all the time, but if you wrap yourself up in the situation, what, what does the game tell me that I should be doing right now? Move a guy over, you know, work a deeper count, uh, take, you know, take what the game gives you. You'll never be wrong. I'm not saying it's always going to work, but if you take what the game gives you, you'll never be wrong. And it's hard because you're watching big league games now where it's, it's nine individuals that go up there about themselves. Like you look at the Rays and the, guardian game it was 15 innings of nothing but punch outs and one guy had a walk off homer there's nine guys going up there trying to get big and 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 you know and then you watch the padres last night i'm looking at juan soto lays a bunt down and he where's his ground the ground ball that put the nail in their coffin was a a ground ball he let get deep and he hit it down the third baseline for a two rbi single it shows up in october but you know like those things and you have to have the opportunity to get that and i understand that but like what the padres are doing i always you know the, the Braves last year, you know, the big, I tell Braves fans like, Oh, we have a Kuna back last this year. I go, well, and I managed against a Kuna on the way up a tremendous app, tremendous player. Right. But I go, the best thing that happened to the Braves last year. And the only reason why you won a world series is because a Kuna got hurt. You got Jock Peterson, you got Eddie Rosario, you got, you know, you, you brought some guys back who were multifaceted in the game to where, they can do what the game dictates. Um, Padres last night, ground ball, sliders, bunt the guy over. Did it work all the time? No, but they're hitting ball. They're making contact. They're putting the balls in play. And you know, they'll hit the ball, the Astros. They'll hit the ball to the other side of the shift in October. But you have to have the ability to do it. And that's my biggest joke was like, 
you know, I fight in Minnesota. Like, we want to try to win games eight to one. I'm like, I'm sorry. You're not going to beat Justin Verlander eight to one in October. Like, you're not. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like, yeah, a home run, absolutely. But, like, everybody that grabs a bat in October is dangerous. Like, everybody that's in on those teams can hit a home run at any given time. And it's just being able to stay within yourself. But if you try to hit a ball hard, good things happen. Whereas if you wrap yourself up in what the team needs, good shit happens usually. And if you're up there trying to get big or trying to do something you're not capable of doing, bad stuff happens. And that's kind of where you're watching. That's what I see in these big league games. Like, damn, like, like infield in three guys on the right side. Infield in. There's no one on the left side of the field. Like, how are we not even attempting? Like, oh, well, they always pitch me inside. I go, okay, but there was a couple that leaked out over that you just weren't willing to change. And that's and again, I don't, I don't fault the players. Like, I'm not one of those guys that like I never wanted to be that guy that that was you remember it, where the guys were like, Well, back when I played, I don't ever say that. The point is, like you take what the game gives you. You can't, you can't go wrong. Like there's nothing wrong with shortening up and, and just trying to do a job. And it's like, and I, I don't want to sound like that grumpy old man, but it's man, like they shifted us. They shifted me too. I mean, social Mike Sosha did it in 2001 in Anaheim. And like, yeah, I spent a couple games trying to hit the ball to the open side of the field and it didn't work, but they had guys who could command a fastball. Not all these guys can command it like they used to. I watched it, seen it for the last 10 years in the minor leagues that they don't develop, like command's the last thing they care about. Um, but it's just having the process to understand it. And I don't blame the players because they're getting paid to do this. Like they all, like we have a short window of making money for our families and they are paying for the ball to go over the fence. So the guys are trying to give them what they want. And when they start paying guys hitting 300, like they pay the guys that hit it over the fence, you might see it change. But until then, it's not going to happen. I mean, I always say Billy Miller should have been a 15 to $18 million guy. He switch hitter, won a batting title, plays solid defense, grinds out at bats. You give me nine Billy Millers, we'll never lose a game. We'll get beat. But we're never going to beat ourselves. And that's kind of where the game has gone, where everybody wants to pay for homers and it's okay to hit 210 and it's okay to strike out 200 times. Like, holy moly, like if, if we struck out 100 times, it was like we had to repeat the level of minor leagues. And now it's like, man, he only struck out 110 times. I'm like, well, hell, that's one a game. Like that's, like, that, that's just not, that's not, uh, there's no, I just feel like we've taken, the number one thing in baseball is about adjustments. And we've allowed the player to not. Yeah, we've forced. We've allowed the players not to force themselves to make adjustments. Just like the whole NIL thing and the transfer portal, we're allowing them to just go where if it doesn't work out here, I can go here and then I can go there. Well, we're forcing that. We're making the hitters okay to not make adjustments because it's okay if you punch out four times. I can honestly say, like if. I think I only hat tricked one game in my career and it was in triple a ever. Like if I struck out twice in a game, like I was like, I am a complete train wreck. Like I, I if I can't put a ball in play, like you, I was like, it was the most like derailing personality trait in the history of the world. Like I just swung a miss twice. Like, how is that possible? And like, there's no, like, I just feel like we're allowing them to, it's okay to not to take the fight out of the game. I'm just going to air it out and, hope for the best. And if I click it, great. And if I don't, it's okay. It's okay. I just struck out. And like, that's to me, that's just not okay. That's like two strike hitting is about a personality. Are you willing to like foxhole? Are you in my foxhole? I use that in a high school team. Are you in our foxhole? Are you willing to do whatever you have to do to put this ball in play? And I think that's part of where we're losing, where everything is right. They don't show the layup anymore. They don't show the 12 foot jumper. They show the half court, Steph Curry shooting balls from the cheap seats, which is cool. Don't get me wrong. But in a game, like it's three pointers, three pointers, pass up the layup, get three pointer, you know, like it's just, we're losing the, and they always wonder, well, the fundamentals are going out the window. Like, cause no one cares anymore. Like they don't, no one's willing to do them anymore because they, it doesn't matter to them. Like it's all about punch outs and, and homers. And that's, it's not a fun product to watch. And that's, 
where like like we have a we're part of a fraternity that was we're the tip of the sword and i don't like when people you know right or wrong i don't like negativity about our sport i just don't because everybody says it's boring and yeah it's always been boring but, but october games aren't because every pitch matters and it, it's even harder to watch even in october now because you know what you know what's going to happen and it's that's the hard part. I don't like when people say negative things about a sport that I love as much as, as, as I do. And just, you know, changing the rule of bases, the size of pizza boxes, you know, the, the trying to change the pitch clocks. You've got the, the, whatever the intercom Correct. system is for the catchers to the pitcher. I mean, right. The whole thought process is, go- and, and if you ask the fans, I spoke at the Texas Rangers women's club the other day and they, they're just, they're fed up. No, nope. it's just been, it's not fun for them anymore. They're not having, and the players aren't they're, – they're not like we used to be either. They're not engaging with the fans anymore, right? right? They're more concerned with their social media. And granted, they've, you know, they've got the nets up. It's almost like plate glass where you can't even talk to anybody. But just that whole – the whole social interaction is gone, right? When we were fans, we'd be able to walk up and down and talk to people and talk to fans and everything else. And that's, that's gone. So, I mean, it's mm-hmm. – and, yeah, and, and, and baseball is making a lot more money, but yet – they're losing. So what, so what's going on through these TV deals, right? They're lo- so, so what's going on? I mean, is it, it's not, it's, it's not that far gone from where we were. It's just like you said, it's that slippery slope. And is there any way just to get it back? Is the, I guess is the biggest thing. It's funny. It made me think of another thing. Like when the whole Astro scandal came out, I remember when they started bringing, you know, the extra, a couple extra computer guys, right. And more iPads and, technology and cameras and i was like careful what you wish for like, pandora's box there, right there it's it's a pandora's box it's like something's gonna happen and this was this was hell this was 2006 when i was still playing 2007 like be careful what you wish for this is gonna get bad and we saw it and did that the astro thing happened and now i mean hell I've, I had to go to the wristband just to give signs. And I'm like, that's a lost art too. That's part of being a baseball player is getting signs. It's part of the game to, you know, look at the third base coach, try to figure it out. You know, it's like, that's part of it. But when we take it away and like, we've tried to make it simpler, we've tried to and it end up being more complicated and the, the interaction is different because, you know, you know, it's a little crazier. And like the, the netting part, you just said, I got fired for the tigers because of the netting believe it or not that's a whole nother story but um uh you know like it, you have all this money you have all this everything's supposedly growing but yet our fans like the fans have never felt more disconnected from what and i feel like that's what you know i joke around that's what kind of made me a, a fan favorite in minnesota because like we were regular guys like we were you know aj Troy Hawkins, Eddie Gordado, like we were regular dudes. Like we weren't like, like I always let people in on what it was like to be over four. Like I, it, yeah, like, trust me, I'd have booed my, I'm booing myself. You just can't hear it. Like I, I, there's a personal side to it. Like it, it, every at bat mattered. And like, that's kind of my group was like that, but like, we weren't like these, Im, like, uh, like you, play with them and you had Juan and you know Pudge those guys were like immortals right like there's I always said there's there should have been another level for those guys right like we were just regular size um just I always feel like regular guys we weren't Frank Thomas right we weren't you know like those guys that could do exceptional things I always said like there should have been a, a higher level for those guys and we just played the big leagues and it would have been a lot more fun for us us average people I always feel like you know, I used to play with Alex Rodriguez in New York. I was like, every day you don't come to work with a smile on your face, I'm going to kick you in the nuts. I said, you think the game is hard with the skill set you have? Try playing nine innings with this stuff. I like, can see how much fun the game is. Like, and that was just kind of like a joke, but it was like, it's the truth. And like, that's today's, like, and I don't blame the players again, just because like, there's some freaking nut jobs out there too. I mean, like, there's some, you know, social media, it's, those kids, like, I felt, I almost feel bad for them in a sense because everything's so like accessible. Like the stuff people say, I mean, a football team loses two games, fire them. I'm like, wait, hang on a second. Like, like, <laughs> why are we just so quick to just, you know, act some dude? Like, I remember like the, looking on Facebook today, some guy was like, this bum stuck, a Met fan, you know, this bum 
stuck it up. You know, this we got one hit by some bum. Like that bum has a World Series ring, and someone gave him a hundred million dollars. He ain't a bum just because you haven't heard from him, I heard about him because you're wrapped up in New York City and the Mets and every, everything else. Like doesn't make him a bum. Like who would give you like if you would you ever call that guy a bum to his face? Like no. Like I was watching the guy who pitched last Musgrove pitch last night. Like that guy looks like a serial killer. Like that guy. Like I want. I'd love to play behind this dude. Like this guy looks like he wants to eat somebody. Like there's an intimidation factor. I'm like, but because no one's ever heard of him because he's played in Houston, he's played in San Diego. Like this dude's stuff is elite. Like this dude's an animal. Like. But that's the point. Like, this guy can just have the freedom to call this guy a bum. And I know it was tongue-in-cheek. But still, like, you keep reading that stuff, and, like, they forget that we have kids, and kids read the stuff. And, you know, it's just like there's – it's everybody's a keyboard badass. And until you confront them, you know, it's like when you confront them, they're like, oh, 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 I guarantee you if that guy stood right in your face right now, you'd be on one knee asking for his autograph. I know I would be. But you it, you have the you think it's okay to just go ahead and just berate somebody? I always said this even before social media became big. I was like, they was like, well, what's it like? I go, let me tell you this. Let me come to your work and follow you around for a, just a day, and when you pick up the coffee pot, just have me scream in your ear. The coffee sucks, you know, like just like and, and see how you react. And just have someone in your face. 24 7 and see what it's like and that that's that's the negative side not a negative side but that's like i never forget i had a kid i had a kid an eight-year-old kid in met when i was playing for the mets he looked at me as like you suck doug and and like we wanted lol over bay i said hey i said i go the sad thing is i said i always go back to this line like i might suck but your dad paid harder money to come watch my sorry ass play. So the real dumbass is the guy sitting here, right? <laughs> Not me. So like, you know, it's like, so it's like, yeah, I might suck, but you paid harder money to come watch my sorry ass play. And like the line, when other line was, I don't know if this is a G show, but it was like, I always say this was like, don't get mad because you're, your kid wants to be me and your wife wants to fuck me. And that was kind of like a line that all the guys always used to use. And it was like, I heard that. I was like, that's fantastic. Like that's outstanding. But that, you know, it's like, what gives like, I, I, I my son does it. Like he, you know, he fancy football and watching games on TV. What he do with my players in the minor leagues? And I was like, dad, he, like, he sucks. And I'm like, hang on a sec. This kid dominated every level he ever played at. And he's playing professional baseball. He doesn't suck. I go, if you have the career he has, I'll be the proudest dad on the planet. So let's pump the brakes with, oh, he sucks. Because your friends get around your little clique and you guys say all that stuff, which I get it. They're kids and I understand. I go, but don't forget that this guy was uh, his area's best player he's ever seen to this point. I go, so until you're in his shoes, let's back off the he sucks comment until you prove otherwise. And that's kind of like, you know, it's like, it's just what gives a person the right to you know, pay him good money to come watch. But like, you can't just say whatever you want to. Like, well, I always said, like, players should be allowed to, like, you should be allowed to punch one umpire and one fan per year with no repercussions. <laughs> and I think the world would be a fa- happier place. <laughs> Jesse, and there are guys that want to do that. They, well, they'll figure out ways to, to, to do something to that, to that effect. It's just been, <laughs> but you're right. It's that, uh, gosh, it, it, that's uh-huh. all it comes down to. They, and it, but just I uh, watch in, in a few more years, you won't even be able to cheer. It'll just be, you won't be able to have sign. You won't be able to say anything. It'll be like the golf course. Ever, there'll be 60,000 of those quiet signs you hold up. That's what this <laughs> is coming to, right? So you can't, shh, shh. He's, can't offend he's gonna, anybody. He's got, yeah, th- yes, that. exactly. He's got, yeah, you're, you're, you're offending somebody and everything else. So, um, but no, that, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting to see where, where, where it's headed. And, uh, you know, it's, gosh, I don't know. It'll be should we revisit this in a few years just to see. I tell these guys whenever we're talking to see what it'll what it'll be like. You know, hopefully we can at least make some sort of a change. But I think back at Tom Kelly, like Tom Kelly would have been fired in three hours. And you're talking about a Hall of Fame manager. Like Tom Kelly wouldn't make it a week coaching these guys. And I didn't like 
at the time going through it, playing for him, but I am forever grateful that I played for him. Um, like I joked around, like, well, I had Denny Hawking, Latroy Hawkins, um, Michael Kadire, uh, a lot, uh, a lot of ex twins, uh, were at this 18 U national team. And we were absolutely joking. Lunch McKenzie. We had a bunch of guys like, like, uh, coaching these 18 U team and the way we were teaching stuff, like we would joke around be like, Oh my gosh, that's TK up there. But like, it stuck with us because he believed in fundamentals so much that like watching him, like, and it stuck with us and it's, it's helped us be, you know, help us be players and help us be better players, help us be better coaches and help us, you know, just teaching. And I was like, you think about how many guys that I, that I played for that really, really wouldn't, they wouldn't even give him the chance to coach. I mean, if Bill Belichick started his career right now, he wouldn't make it. And you're talking about arguably the greatest head coach in NFL history, right? I mean, like the way he does things just aren't, I mean, you look at his disciples all over the place, you know, they try to do emulate what he did. And they didn't last two years because of today's society, but you're talking about, some of the greatest managers and head coaches to ever, ever, ever do it that wouldn't get the opportunity to do it now because they didn't do everything the way someone else wanted them to do it. And that's, that's also not fair too, but you know, it's like, I, I just, I mean, like, like this Tom Manley, my gosh, he, seven years with the Marlins and he's, this guy has the patience of, you know, Gandhi and like, and he's a great human being and like, if he has, you know, if he's had enough, like, what does that actually say? Like, Donnie's the, like, probably, in my opinion, top two or three managers in today's game that doesn't get the credit he deserves and has always been negatively influenced by what people say about him. But he was always, like, he's brilliant baseball mind. And, like, they're, like, they're dropping by the wayside. And I always like joke around, not joke around, but like I'm starting to think what World Series was it? Was it, you know, it was Dave Roberts. I think it was Dave against, I think it was AJ, it was AJ Hinch with the Astros at the time. And like they just kept making bad move after bad move after bad move. And I was like, there's no way in hell that Dave Roberts really wanted to do that. But the game was mapped out before it started rich hill was throwing like a no hitter right it was that year when he was yeah. dominating and he lost they ended up losing i don't know if it was the, against the astros or the red Sox that year but I'm, like, I'm going like there's no way doc's making those calls like you like they lost the world series in game two because of pulling rich hill and everybody else got exposed and i was like there's no way in hell if they allow him to have feel what's going on that they would have pulled him in that situation. No way. Even if Rich Hill is, if his data said he fades after from pitch 65 to 80, but he's got it going on right now. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to take him out right now. Like there's, uh, there's, there's human elements to this stuff. And I'm just like, like let the guys manage the game. You can't map out baseball. You can't, you can't sit down before the game starts and be like, yeah, you want to go over it and go over situations and what if this happens, that happens, this happens. I mean, thinking who was the other one that, uh, you know, they are the, the you know, Kevin Cash and Blake Snell. Like, what? I had managed against Blake Snell the whole way up. He he had a hard time, you know, if they were being very careful with him when he was at the Rays. And then, you know, and <clears throat> and then he gets to the big leagues and it's like, He's he's throwing what was it a one or two hitter at the time and it was dominating. All of a sudden they take him out and they lost. It's like there's no way that that wasn't discussed beforehand. Like if, if Blake Snell keeps pitching, they have a world. They have a, they probably have a, a ring on their finger. But that's the point. Like you put these guys in these positions because they're willing to just say they're going along with what goes what what is being told. Like almost like a puppet, and that's. Like it's just bothersome because those guys are already good baseball people. Like they have, they, they understand situations. They just let them be them and not interfere at times. Yeah, we have a game plan, but have the freedom to be like, look, man, it from the side, he was a dominating as a guy. Like, and the feel of the other team, how many times have you, pl you were playing in a game 
when someone came and got the starter, you exhaled. You're like, thank God they just pulled that guy out of the game. I don't care who they bring in. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, but you gave us, you gave us life. You gave us a chance. And I'm like, I guarantee you when they took Blake Snell out, they were like, thank the Lord. Like, oh, now they, they, that they just screwed up. It's over now. And then boom, you know, it's like, just because you might have great numbers off a guy for 10 years, but that it's not about 10 years. It's about right now. Like that stuff is dirty. I'm having trouble with this. And you know, as a hitter, like that looks different today than it has in the past. And like, we're in trouble tonight. And that, that, that's the part of the game. I think that gets eliminated because of so many people have in their hand and how things, how things are run and how things are done. We're losing the ability and we're losing the ability to have the manager have the same, be like, yes, I know what we discussed, but what's going on right now, we have to let it ride. And we're going to, like, I go back to Tom Kelly. I remember the stories hearing when he was in 91, Jack Morris threw nine innings, right? Do a nine inning complete game and the game went 10. And TK went over to him and says, hey, I, I got so-and-so up. We've done enough. And he goes, and Jackson's reply was, you're not taking me out of this effing game. And TK turned, looked at him, turned around and goes, he goes, screw it, it's just a game. It was game seven of the World Series. Yeah. But TK had the ability to say, oh, okay, you know, like, <laughs> you're right, it's just a game. And that's, and he went out and threw the 10th and they end up winning. But like that part of decision making that that's why you get those jobs because you have the ability to process and determine, hey, this, tonight's the night. Yeah, he usually we usually pull him after six, but and it's just it's so proven the other way that it happened to the Cardinals the other day. They pull what Quentin Quentin Quintana after he's dominating. They pull him. You start chasing outs in the sixth, it's gonna come back and bite you. It happens all the time. You know, it's like he's throwing a shutout. You got to score to win anyways, but you're gonna shortchange your bullpen, which is already short. By pulling them in the sixth with 70 pitches, sometimes let them go. You know what? You know, let them go. You know, they, they bashed Donnie Manley for pulling, for letting Kershaw pitch back in the day. Well, Kershaw pitch 120 is better than anybody else they really have out there, but you want to blame Donnie for leaving his horse out there. Well, he knows that he knows what the outcome is going to be if you bring in the other guy. It's like Grady Little with Pedro. You know, yes, probably should have took him out, but. When Pedro says, I want to stay in the game, you leave Pedro in the game. Like, it is what it is. It didn't work out. It doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. It, you know, end up being the other way. But you know what I mean? Like, you're in a lose-lose situation sometimes. But at the same token, like, you have to have belief in the guy that's with those players 260 days out of the year. Yeah, and that's that's what they're doing. They're undercutting all these managers, and that's not what they – how they want to do it and they want to do it i think you know what maybe they need to do they probably all just need to chill maybe that's what they need i was telling you about these cbds these gummies here there you go there you go this is probably what they need to do they it's a it's just a a hemp gummy here recreational stuff maybe it'll get take the edge off maybe every one of the guys needs to just take one get on there let them just chill out because then they'll probably stop thinking so much, right? That's what they do. Chase, chase it with an H H and M. You can chase it with some Herman Marshall yeah. whiskey. This this stuff is good. Like I said, I, I said this stuff. It's good for help me sleep. I take two of these, and I about 30, 45 minutes after a little bit of whiskey, and that couch just engulfs me. You're ready to go. The one I think would be better. Like I said, these guys. I think it's just this whole generation. They just need to stop. They need to just chill, chill out, and just stop thinking so much, right? Just like you talk with, turn your brain off. And maybe maybe that's what these all these products are here for to help you turn your brain off, right? And just have fun. And, just amen. have fun, right? Amen. I just I I feel like my son is I my son is a prime example. He's he'll take a swing off the tee and he'll immediately spit out. Oh, I pulled off. I did. I go, hang on. Has anybody ever counted a hit in the cage? I go no. I go. I go. I don't need. I always like you always talk about the post game analysis. I don't need a post swing analysis with every swing you take. I saw it. You felt it. Put the ball on the tee, put it back on, take your swing, fix it. And then we go, we don't need to discuss it every time. But I, I don't know if I made him that way, probably because that's how I was as a hitter, but the same token, I'm like George Brett always talked about 
I took a bad swing. I took a step out, took my regular swing. I was like, oh, there it is. All right, I'm good. And like, that's what I'm trying to teach. I'm like, stop over analyzing every damn swing. I'm pointing out why it happened to for you to gain knowledge and fix it yourself. I'm not over harping that you're searching for a perfect swing that doesn't exist. I go, they just, they don't like the perfect swing. You might take what seven to 15 times. If you get 600 plate appearances and that's the reality and half of them are probably outs because they're right out somebody. So you're searching for this magical unicorn that doesn't exist. Just be consistent. Just try to be consistent. Don't overanalyze it. If you took a bad one, put a ball back on the tee, get back on the horse, take your good one. Okay, we're good. And start to build trust that way. But I think with all this slow motion cams and perfect game crap and, and you know, this video and sending videos to this thing and, and put this swing rap soto, look at this and diamond kinetic. And I'm like, Holy moly. Like I, we had it my last year in Detroit and I was like, you have all this stuff. Like I, I, I can't keep up with it. Like, when do I get to manage? Cause I'm behind the computer screen with this stuff, logging this data, putting this stuff in, looking at this film, trying to figure out who's pitching tonight from whether he's in Detroit or in Detroit. It's like, I, I'm not even playing and I'm my brain's fried. And I like, I can't keep up with this. No wonder these kids are like, they have, they, their brain is so clogged up. They can't make decisions. They can't figure out adjustments because there's just so much stuff wandering through their brain to compete. It's like, just get back to competing. Let's just try that because it's more fun that way, right? We'll fix all the other stuff before the game. Once the game starts, just get back to wiffle ball. Yeah. And that's, and that's, you know, that's kind of what I tell my guys pitching wise. I tell my guys hitting wise. I'm like, yeah, you, there's times to think on defense, think about before it happens. Da, da, da. I go, but, you know, like the the word approach is gone. Like I even even the eighteen U team I had and spending some, you know, spending three or four, three weeks with those kids, like I was like, What's your approach? And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, Well, what do they what do you think? Because we obviously you play like Chinese Taipei, you play Japan, you play Korea, you play South Africa. So you're facing sixty five one day and 100 the next day, and 88 from a sidearm guy. There is approaches to that. Like, do they match up well with what you do? And they're like, I don't, I've never really talked about that. I'm like, well, that's more important than what you mechanically do, yes, right or wrong. Like, everybody has holes. It's just the people with good approaches. I always say, give me nine guys with mediocre swings and great approaches over nine great swings and no approach, and I'll beat you every time because we're going to figure the approach is where it's all where it's at. Like you can cover holes up with a proper approach. And like, that's the word that to me always goes back to that. It's, it's not preached enough at the earlier ages. Cause they don't, the, this, the swing gurus on social media, they don't have to deal with that stuff. They're just working on mechanics in the cage. Well, then there's game situations that they, they don't know because they've never done it or they don't have the time to do it. And they, it's that's the number one part of hitting that's gone away because they, they don't have to, because it's all one way. It's all swing hard, like caveman. Like I swing hard, I swing up and hope I get three cracks at it. And if I make contact, great, it'll be really high and hopefully really far. And if I don't, it's okay. I'll just go back to the dugout and take my next three hacks. So there's no adjustment or no approach to what we're trying to do. And I think that's the number one key for kids at a young level is just understanding who you are and be the best at what you do, do what you do best and be great at it. And if whatever that means, yeah, if you're, if you, you know, you're trying to teach an eight year old kid to hit over the fence, it's just stupid. It's just like, it's just not going to work. Like my, my job is to fix your swing at the age level I have to when you grow into your man body, that's, now everything now we have the perfect storm you've taught that you've learned the mechanics of a swing you've learned your approach and then when you get out of your you know newborn fawn stage where you just hit puberty where you can't like your legs lo look like they've worked together when all that kind of clicks we have you know the the, the well-oiled machine but until then we're going to work on stupid uh, you guys think is stupid and not worthy but trust me this is the stuff that is going to make you who you want to become 
by the time all this comes together. And I think that's the number one thing that gets lost in, in today's world is that they don't, they don't see the small things and they don't want to work on them because everything is, they're so results and fast. I want fast results now. And it's just not going to work that way. Yeah. It's, you've got to go backwards before they can go forward. And that's, and that's the thing. They just, they want it all right away and there's no, nothing to it. Guys are throwing harder yet. They're going to create longer swings. Eh, right. It seems like it's, you're making out. it, you're making, you're making, you're playing, right. You're playing like Tom Kelly always used to tell us, I don't care if you don't play for us, just don't play for them. And that was, that's pretty much what hitters do now. Like you're playing right into their strength. You're, you're attacking their strength, which is really stupid. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, I want to know what you have, but like, you know, don't, I don't care if you don't play for us, just don't play for them. Well, there's a lot of hitters that just go up and I'm going to slay the beast and I'm going to do, I, I'm doing exactly what he wants me to do. And that's just not a recipe for success. No, no, but I don't know. Like I said, we'll see where this we'll see where this ends up here, Doug, in the next next few years and whatnot. Um, we appreciate you jumping on here today. Like I said, I know you've got you've got some some kids going on, some high school stuff going on, and everything. But I appreciate you stepping on here and and letting people hear what uh, your thoughts are, because everybody likes to hear you know different stories of what guys think, what they went through, and and uh, like I said, the, our, us old school guys are trying to keep it that way. But maybe we found the result. Maybe we need to have some Herman Marshall whiskey and some early bird <laughs> CBD handed out. Uh, right that's, before the game, so everybody can just just relax, and then when they're done, they can just they'll you know they can go they have some more. At, yeah, exactly. They can have a pregame. <laughs> they can have one after the game. So we you shall we shall no see. Four. And I'll, I'll send you some of these these early bird. You can try these things out, man. But I appreciate it. And like I said, we'll see uh, we'll see where this ends up in the next few years, man. Uh, yes, good luck sir. with your I high school, and then we'll, when I start my podcast, you better come on my show too. Absolutely, I'm I'm already off right there. And uh, like I said right, we'll buddy. get out and play some golf some one day too. So I appreciate it, Doug. Thanks, man.